So let's let's learn a little bit. Parshas Titzave. Parshas Titzave. We have we have a nice story. We have a nice vart from Ramosha, and we have a, a beautiful thought from the Heli Geslanim Rebbe and Nesiva Shalom. Hopefully, somehow the three will uh, will interconnect with each other, and if not, it'll, it'll hopefully be each nice points. So the parsha begins. Va'ata Titzave Bnei Yisrael V'Yichu Elach Hashem In Zay Yizach Kosis Lamar Lahalos Ner Tamid The Menayra. You take oil, you beat it down, crushed up oil, and you bring it up as a lahalis ner tamid, that it's going to be there tamid. And the measure says, what does it mean, tamid? It means it's there forever. It's there forever. And the question is, what in the world does that mean? The Meneir is still here today? Really? No, no, it's not. Where is it? Where is the Meneir here forever? So that's the question that, uh, what do you say? Oh, very good, very good, very good, very good. That's where we're going to start. That is the question that the, the Salon of Marebel and Nesiva Shalom over here comes to answer. And he quotes a famous medrash, as your Menachem just said, that what happened when the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, the Menorah was hidden. Menorah was nignaz with, with a bunch of other items. There were four items, says the medrash, that were hidden when the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. The Arayim, okay. The Aish, excuse me, five items. The Ruach HaKodesh, whatever that means, the Hakruvim, now whether Ish and Ruach HaKadosh is one thing and two, and the Menorah. Yeah, it's Aaron and Kuvim. So probably we could call it four items. Oh, okay, so we could probably call it Aaron and Kuvim, we could say is maybe one with the Ish of the Mizbeach, and then you have the Menorah. Now the question is, if we were to think about these items, there's something very different about all these items. The Arain, the Keruvim, Ish and Ruch HaKadosh are all one type of item. They're all pure Ruchnius, Kadesh HaKadoshim, Ruch HaKadosh, Arain HaKadosh, with the Luchais inside of it, the Keruvim. So now we all understand why that is Nignaz. Then you have the Menaira. Where was the Menaira standing? Not inside the Kadesh HaKadoshim. The Menaira was outside. So why is the Menaira put into this same category as these other items, the Menorah being hidden with them. And with this, we can come to explain what it does it mean that the Menorah is there forever. This is Gemara Chagiga. And the Gemara Chagiga teaches us very famously that when a Kaddish Baruch Hu created the world, there was an R, there was a light. They were able to see from one end of the world to the next end of the world. And then what happened was Hashem was nistakel, and Hashem saw that he can't keep this R around, this spiritual light. And what did he do? He took this light and he hid it. And where did he hide this light for? Tzadikim la'asid lavoi. That there's this special spiritual light, perhaps this is the light also of Ruach HaKadosh, that is hidden for, ah, that is hidden for Tzadikim for la'asid lavoi. Asid lavoi. This is the light of the Menorah. What happens when you light the Menorah? The Menorah is a spiritual light. Of course, there's a physical component to it. But there's an Ara Laikos, there's a spiritual light that is there. How do we know that? Who made the Menorah? Moshe Rabbeinu, right? No, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't make the Menorah. Very good. The Menorah was made by Hashem. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't able to make the Menorah. What did he do? He took the block of gold. He didn't know what to do. He threw it in the fire and it was made by Hashem. Funny thing, of all the things he couldn't make the Menorah, it's the same type of question. What, why the Menorah and all these items point to the same detail? That the Menorah, even though one would think, yes, it was in the regular Mishkan, yes, it's not as spiritual as the Kedusha Kedashim, as the Aroin, as the Luchais, as the Kruvim. But no, that's not true. The Menorah was an entity that was made by Hashem, an entity that was hidden ultimately. And now we understand why it was hidden, because it was in that same category. And that's why the Menorah is really Lamala Minateva. That's what it means that it's, it's going to be Lahalis Ner Tamid. It's going to be burning forever. And now with this, what. No, no, that's, that's the whole fight. It's Nignaz. The Medjur says it was Nignaz. Now, what happened with Titus? Titus thought he had it. Maybe he did have it. Maybe they stole it back. What's on the Arch of Titus? Maybe that was a picture. Maybe he had a different one. Maybe that was a picture created as they were taking it, but it was taken away. Oh, uh, good, 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 good. This is all the historical tidbits, which nothing is absolute, by the way. No, nothing is, uh, you know, but very good. But then what we see, what we come up with is one simple idea. 
is that the Menaira was not something so simple. The Menaira was an entity that was there forever. Now, why, why is this relevant to us? Why is this relevant to us? Because the Menaira had this R, had this light that was forever. This light of Hashem, this light for us and lovely. This light that was hidden. So what does that have to do with us? So there's two beautiful details, and this is going to bring us to Ramayisha. The Balaturim says, Ner Tamid, those letters, is Gematria Shabbos. Where else was this R, was this spiritual light hidden? In Shabbos Kodesh. Comes Shabbos, there's also a otherworldly R that descends into this world. That's part of our Neshama Yisera that we get each and every week. And that's what comes on Shabbos. But the problem is, the Minaira had how many candles? Not just one burning. There were seven candles. So the answer is, Shabbos gives Shefa, gives Bracha to wear all the days of the week. So there's this spiritual light, which is Shabbos, this Araganos, that comes down on Shabbos, but then it spills over and affects the rest of our week. And therefore, in reality, every day of the week, what do we say? Ayyem Yim Rishon B'Shabbos, Ayyem Sheni B'Shabbos. What are we doing? We're drawing forth some of this otherworldly spirituality that is there, lost and lovely forever and ever, that we get every Shabbos and comes out the whole week. But this sounds very esoteric. It sounds very high and lofty. So I'd like to bring this down a little bit in two ways. He, Nesim Shalom almost hiddenly here throws in one line, and if you're reading it fast, you can miss it, and I almost did. There's a medrash that says, where else is this hidden light hidden? This hidden light is hidden for those who are Amal Batayra, one who learns, and that doesn't learn Taira. There's two levels, there's two levels, and uh, you know, sometimes it's not politically correct to say these things in public because people get insulted. What do you mean? There's different levels of learning Taira. The answer is, yeah, there's different levels, let's be honest. There's learning Taira, yeah, you said it a year. We're all sitting here with a bowl of chow, and it's nice, it's light, it's easy, it's fluffy. It's fluffy, we'll call it. And that's Taira. But then there's Amal Batayra. What's Amal Batayra? Amal Batayra is when it's not so simple, not so easy. And there's two types of Amal. There's Amal, there's toil in consistency. That's one type of Amal. To do something every day takes a lot of hard work. And then there's, then there's Amal in difficulty. In difficulty, in what's difficult? In Gemara. In Gemara. There's a reason why the world learns Gemara. Gemara is not so simple. Someone said to me this past week, why do we start with the second parak of Sukkah? I said, he's like, it's not so simple, all this Toma business and this oil business. It's not so easy. So I blamed it on the guy who suggested it. And it's true, it's true. It isn't so simple. There are difficult parts. But what happens? What happens? You push through it and you try to understand it. And again, a little bit and a little bit. And maybe one day you don't do anything more, but you get a little bit more clarity. That is the definition of Amilus, of toil, of hard work, of pushing when it's not easy. That is how you access this hidden light. And that in reality is how you take the hidden light of Shabbos and you bring it throughout the whole week. Is that you have an entire week of Torah a little bit every single day connecting us to Shabbos, thereby taking this entity of the Menorah, this entity which is a Hallelujah's Ner Tamid, always, always, yes, because there's always this light that is there for all of us. And another way he says is that what was the oil cusses? It was crushed. What does it mean that the oil was crushed? So there's two explanations. He goes over here into Yisurim, that when we have difficulties and we still remain steadfast in our Avaida, in our Tefillah, in our Chasadim, that's one level of being crushed. But we could say it in the world of Tyre also. We could say it in the world of Tyre also. The same thing. When you crush yourself, when you break yourself to come when it's not easy, to push yourself when it's not simple, to try to understand when you don't understand, that's another level of Qas Islamar. So, step number one of the day is Va'ata Titzaves B'nei Yisrael. V'yichu Elech Hashem in Zayich Zach. Qas Islamar Lahalois Ner Tamid. How are we getting that Ne'er Tamid? How are we finding that Meneir that is hidden somewhere that's going to come back lost and love by accessing that Ar Haganos, by accessing that hidden light, which by the way, what else does that hidden light give you? That's the light that brings down the Shefa, that of course we know Shabbos Kodesh doesn't cost money. Why doesn't Shabbos cost money? Because Hashem pays for it. Why, why does Hashem pay for it? 
Because when you're living in a different <gasps> realm, when you're living within this world of this Arhagonos, when you're living with Hashem, there's different world, w- rules. And Hashem's paying for it. So now if you take that Arhagonos of Shabbos and you bring it down to the seven levels of the Menorah, the seven candles, and every day have a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, ultimately you're bringing that Shefa of Shabbos to every single day of the week. And that is idea number one, which truth is, we could stop here, but let's continue. Because Ramayisha, Ramayisha is waiting. Ramayisha is waiting. Ramayisha is waiting for the Hasidim amongst us. That was that. Hey, listen, it wasn't that Hasidish. Was it that Hasidish? A little bit. A little bit. Sort of things that we take a little blind faith. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, a little Kabbalistic, a little Hasidish. But listen, when it comes all, when it comes back to Amilus Bataira, it talks to everyone, so no one could be upset at you. But now comes Ramayisha Feinstein. And the Pasik says, Vahaya ha Mizbeach Kaidesh Kadashim. The Mizbeach was Kaidish Kadashim. If I were to ask anyone here, which Mizbeach was called Kaidish Kadashim? If you were to take a guess, there were two Mizbeachis. There was the, what did he say? Right, the Mizbeach Bani Mizbeach is The Mizbeach Bani is made out of gold, a small Mizbeach, which they brought the Keteris on. The Mizbeach Chitzen is a massive structure made out of copper, where they brought large Karbanas. So you're right, by the way, obviously, but what would one have thought? One would think, which is the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the one inside, the one next to the Menorah that we're talking about, the one that's opposite, says the Pasuk, the Arun. That should be called Kodesh HaKadoshim. Yet the Pasuk doesn't say that. The one that's called Kodesh HaKadoshim is the one outside, is the copper one. Asks Ramayisha Feinstein, I don't understand why does the Torah label the outside Mizbeach, the quote-unquote less holy Mizbeach, the copper Mizbeach? Why is that called Kaidesh HaKadoshim? Whereas the inside Mizbeach, the small one, the golden one, the Kataires, that's called Kaidesh. Hashem always likes the little guy. Oh, oh, so that, that's the answer. But now let's, let's let Ramesh's words talk to us. And now this really is, is a perfect Hemshech. Because what do we just talk about? Well, at whatever level we just understood, but we just learned that when one learns Tyro, what happens is he's connected to Hashem in a very deep way, on a way that there's some otherworldly R, this light that we don't know what that means, but somehow it connects to us, somehow it lights us up, it brightens us up, it gives us bracha, etc. Says Ramayisha Feinstein, you know why the outside Mizbeach was called Kaidesh HaKadashim? Two different reasons. Number one, to me, and I'm going to read his words, even though we always point out these are not actually the words of Ramay Feinstein. This is a transcript, but they're beautiful anyways. To me, Shemaisav the Beis HaMedrash Heim Kaidesh. Someone who is actions in the Beis HaMedrash are holy. Sarich Lirois, he has to make sure he is seen. Shemaisav Chutz Lekois Le Beis HaMedrash when you're outside of the Mishkan has to be Kaidesh HaKadoshim. When you're inside, when you're next to the Ara, and when you're next to the Menaira, you're Kaidesh, you're holy, you're a beautiful person. So what happens when you leave the base Medrash? What happens when you go to work? What happens when you interact with other people? Says Ramayisha, now you have to make sure your actions are even holier. They're Kaidesh HaKadoshim. And he says, you know why? Because you're going to meet people who are lower than you. People that don't learn every day. People that maybe don't even daven every day. Maybe people that aren't any level affiliated. Maybe not even Jews. So what do you have to do to them? You have to meet them in a world of Kaidesh Kadashim, says Ramayisha. You know why? Kol Hanegea Boy Yikdash. Beautiful. It says the Pasuk, anything that touches it becomes holy. So if you become the person that you learn every day, you're now a person that learns every day. You're a different person. And I, was, I remarked after tonight's Kenyan, and it blew me away that we're a month in. We're a month in. It's like sometimes you do things, you know, day after day, and like you forget when you do them for a long time. You know, a month is a long time. It's an 18th shear was tonight. That's a long time. We're over two lot in, you know. The first week was like, okay, it was, a, it was a push, you know. The second week was like, okay, we're doing this. The third week was like, hmm, interesting. Four weeks. That means you're doing it. That means you're now a person that learns every day. Welcome, <laughs> Mazel Tov. That person who maybe some of us swore to ourselves when we left whether it was elementary school, high school, or base medrash, that, uh, you know, we don't know if we'll ever be that person. Yeah, we're that person that we're learning Gemara every day. And it's not killing us, believe it or not. And actually, I think we all could say it's, it's not bad. Sometimes it's better than others. Sometimes it's more geschmack, sometimes less. But, you know, to push yourself. And then what are we? 
we're people that when we're during the day, we're Kodesh HaKadoshim. We have to make sure we're Kodesh HaKadoshim, which is number one. That's where the Chazar during the day comes in. You know, the little extra boost. Okay, but that, that's, not, that's not fair. That's just, you know, plugging too much. But no, what does it really mean? It means you're a different person. The truth is, every from Jew, every Jew is, every from Jew is, and you know, as you go higher and higher. So now when you meet people throughout the day, call Hanagea boy Yikdosh, and says her Moshe, Sheyachzeru b'tshuva al yadai. If you're a person, that you are yourself, but you're a person that in the Beis Medrash is Kaidesh, and then outside of the Beis Medrash, you're Kaidesh Kaidesh, you will cause people to be Baalei Tshuva. Why? Because they see you and you're radiating. And this is, you know, we all know that all the good Baal Tshuva stories are not really created from, you know, those really good speeches and the really whatever. It's from those regular interactions, that Friday night meal when the guy ate over and he's like, wow, being Jew- Jewish is normal. Because that's because you took the learning to your Friday night suda and made it Kodesh HaKadoshim. That's entity and idea number one. Absolutely beautiful. And says Ramayisha, Says Ramayisha, what's number two? Demishu Kodesh Misa Medjish Bein Talmidei Chachamim Nechshav, and this is important. Now you have to understand, what do people view you as? Says Ramayisha, you think you're Kodesh. You think in the base measures you're holy. But what do people look at you? The Mizbeach HaChid sign are the people outside of the Mishkan. You know what they think you are? You might not think you are. You might think, oh, what am I doing already? I'm learning a few minutes a day. I'm not any different. Don't accuse me of being so holy. Don't pretend like I'm so special. I'm not. I'm a regular person. Says Ramesha Feinstein, your Nechshav Be'ene Hamoin Am Ki Kodesh HaKadoshim. People view you as different. And therefore, when people view you as different, you could really affect them a lot and they're going to learn from your actions. So this is the duality that we have to realize. And that's what the Torah is teaching us, that the outside Mizbeach is Kodesh HaKadoshim. What does it mean it's Kodesh HaKadoshim? It means that you're Kodesh inside. But when you leave, you have to even be better, which is counterintuitive to the way that we think usually. We think in the base medrash, in the shul, I'm a good guy. <laughs> now is when I dive in, now is when, when I leave, you know what, I leave it all in there. The exact opposite, tafoch as they say in Hebrew. You have to take what you do there and realize, there you go, ah, <laughs> you have to take what you take there and you have to leave and then it's Kodesh HaKadosh and then people learn from you and then that is what is absolutely amazing. I'm going to end with a story. I'm going to end with a, uh, a story. A story, what does it mean to take Taira and be Kodesh HaKadosh? What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? That when you meet someone, he could even become a Baal tshuva. Now, what does it mean, Baal tshuva? Chavra. Baal tshuva doesn't mean that the guy is uh, my, my friend that never wore a yarmulke and started putting on a yarmulke. That's not what it means. Baal tshuva means that you affect someone to be better. It means that someone sees you and says, hey, he learns every day. Maybe I could. Hey, he's a guy that goes to Minyan. Maybe I could. Hey, he's a guy that uh, conducts his business faithfully. Maybe I could. That's also a level of Baal Tshuva. So the Chazanish, the Chazanish famously, when the Gezeira Hagios, when the draft laws came out in Eretz Yisrael, the Chazanish was consumed every waking moment of his day trying to do something to make sure, and this was at a time that they were drafting girls as well, Gios Habanim Vehabanais. And the story goes that in this, there was a time that in his house there was Askanim and Rabbanim, and he was, Chazanish himself was going one to one talking to this one and saying, You gotta go talk to this one and this one. And he was, this was a central hub, and he was busy, busy, busy. And all of a sudden, in walks in a uh, acquaintance, which wasn't so from, but the Chazanish knew back from his youth, back from his youth. So middle of everything, middle of running the entire, you know, Klal Yisrael, he sees this guy walk to his house, he leaves everyone, he goes to the guy, and he sits down with him, he gives him something to drink, and he sits and he schmoozes with him. Chazanish, what, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're saving the world. Why, why, why are you schmoozing with this guy right now? You can schmooze with him later. Oh no, because this is someone that he realized, this is a moment of Kedush HaKadoshim. This is a moment that I, as Chazayin Ish, could be Kol Hanegea Boy Yikdash. I could touch this person. I could talk to him, show him I care about you. And that's an incredible moment. There's another story from Ratzio Salman. I don't know all the details, 
but at the famous uh, City Field uh, Internet Asifa. It was, it was Yudua that this was Rav Matzisio's baby. He literally spent, and some people say he's unwell, one of the biggest reasons was that Asifa. He literally spent, they say, a full year just just pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. And now if you go and you go listen, what did he say at the Asifa? He spoke. Rav Matzisio spoke. You could, you could get the speech, and you'd think like it would be a fiery speech. If I, I don't know exactly what he spoke about, but he didn't actually speak about the internet. What happened? The story goes, and again, I, I don't know the exact details, but it's not so relevant, is that at the time, another cause came up that he felt, listen, I have, uh, whatever it is, 50,000 people here. I could, I, could, I could help that cause. Well, I don't remember if it was elections. I don't remember exactly what it was, and that's what he spoke about. That's someone that took his Kodesh from the base Medjish, and became Kodesh HaKadoshim outside of the base Medrash. Realizing Kol Hanekea Bo Yiktash. So B'siyat Dishmaya, the bracha, the tefillah, the schos that we have is that Amir Tzashem, as much as we are that Minoira of Lahalois Ner Tamid, that we're constantly, constantly, a little bit, a little bit, <laughs> taking that Araganos, finding that hidden light, whether it's in Shabbos and spreading it during the week, whether it's during the week and connecting it to Shabbos. The Amelos Batayra, the Kosis Lamar, breaking yourself and pushing yourself and not saying, okay, I was Yates design, you know, I, I, I put on a share for 14 seconds. I'm going, no, I'm actually going to open the Gemara. I'm actually going to push a little harder. Connect to that art, connect to that Shafa. And then ultimately we have to remember the Christ. We have to remember we're different people. We're people that people view us as Kodesh HaKadoshim. I'm sure that people are looking at the sign that went around that we're having a Kinyin Chazar event on the night of Purim and they're saying, what? They're, they're going to learn on Purim night? What, what, what happened to them? I'm sure people are thinking that. I mean, nah, it's probably a front. They're just going to get drunk. You know, they're not going to really learn. But how did that happen? That happened because you learned a little bit and you learned a little more and you're like, you know what? I could do it. It's a long night. I could sit down and learn for a few minutes and then, yeah, we'll party. Don't worry. You party also. So it's had to be this past week and this will conclude. When did Purim become a day of uh, just learning? What happened? You know, it's Yeshiva's Mordechai Tzadik, Yeshiva's Mordechai Tzadik, Yeshiva's Mordechai Tzadik. And like, when the day ends, you know, you uh, have a Lachayim and call, that's not Purim. The Chavetz Chaim in Radin used to sit through a Purim Shmuel. I think the Chavetz Chaim was quite a busy person. I think he learned a lot of Torah. And yet he sat there at a Purim Shmuel. Because that's Purim. Purim is meant. There's a mitzvah sayyayim. Matadus lev yoyne. Mishleach manais. You drink. You party. And that's, and that's, that's, uh, that's an incredible, incredible, incredible avayda. You know what the truth is? I want to go, go for 90 more seconds to say one thought on Purim. It's something that we're going to repeat. But I just realized if we don't say it now, I don't know when we're going to say it. There's one idea that I heard today about drinking. One idea. What, what happens what happens in Purim? What happens? One idea. I'm looking at the clock. 22.30. We'll be done at 20.40. 90 seconds. Nech nas yayin What does that mean? Wine goes in. Out comes our insights. Sometimes a little bit too much of our insights. Mm-hmm. But what, what does that mean? What exactly happens? What happens is our entire life, we have barriers. We erect barriers. We ourselves are our biggest barrier sometimes. We don't allow ourselves to be our neshamas. Our physical bodies block us. Block us from learning. Block us from davening. Block us from doing certain things that we really could be doing. You know what happens when one gets drunk? Everything's good. Everything's happy. Everything's amazing. Why? Because you're your neshama. All you are are your insights now. You got rid of all your barriers. And no, I like you and I don't like you. And I, I could do this and I can't do this. And I, Why does someone daven like a mention for him? Because he doesn't care anymore what people think of him. He could just connect. He's pure neshama. That's all he is on Purim. So when the wine goes in and all the physicalities leave, Yom Kippurim, you're standing there at Ne'ilah, you're standing there in perfect white, you're a malach. You're a malach on Yom Kippur when you're drunk? Yes, because all you are are your neshama. All you are are your insides because you stripped away all the stupidities of life, all the barriers, all the chitzonis, all the gashmias, all the physicalities. And you let your neshama come out and shine. And that's why Yom Kippur is Yom Kippur. Nechmasein Yatzasoid. Psiyat Neshmaya will certainly be Zaycha.